Hello and welcome back to another episode of Badminton Weekly with me, Jasmine Lim. We may have taken a break last week, but the badminton world surely did not. History was made at the 2022 Asian Games in Hangzhou, and things are not looking to slow down anytime soon as we head into the European League. So plenty to cover today, and later on in the show, we'll have Steen Pedersen. But for now, I'm delighted to have someone else in the studio with me today. Please welcome back Derek Wong, two-time Olympian and former Singapore player. Welcome back to the show, Derek. Hi Jasmine, yeah, good to be here again. Now, before we look ahead at the restart of the tour, let's quickly recap some of the biggest headlines that came out of China. The Korean women's team, they delivered an amazing performance that saw them clinch gold for the first time in almost 30 years. And I think that's incredibly remarkable. And they did so by beating China 3-0 in the final. How impressed were you by them? And do you think they are the strongest women's team currently? Yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed with Korea uh, and uh, I would say they are definitely the strongest team now uh, with Ansei Young leading the, the whole team uh, towards this victory. Definitely, you know, having uh, someone like Ansei Young who has won so many titles this year and getting the, so many finals as well, uh, you, you have a very strong like leader mm. to lead the team into this eventual week that they had. Uh. For me, it's that very first point, the very first singles of any team event is very, very important as it sets the tone for the next uh, teammates that are going on, on court. They will feed off that uh, winning vibe and you know, try to do their best for their team and win the next point. And that's what the first doubles and the second singles of Korea did. And of course, you know, the Korean team, they did this on China's home ground as well. What are your take yeah. on that? So for me, right, I feel that um, the crowd or, or these external factors do not really play much uh, effect on, on the players. You know, they are professional players, they are world-class players. They are able to um, block off all these uh, side, side uh, activities okay. and keep focus on, on their match and their next point. Steen has also given us his take on the Korean's women's team, so look out for that later in the show. But another pair who had a memorable stint in Hangzhou is Chirak Shetty and Sadik Sairaj Frankaretti. They took home India's first ever Asian Games gold medal in badminton, and with that, they are now the new world number one in men's doubles. What do you think is the main reason behind their impressive year so far? Actually, I've seen them play uh, in the few matches leading up to the finals of the Asian Games. And I do see that uh, their style of play is very versatile. Uh, they're able to defend, they're able to attack. They actually have a lot of variation in their gameplay. Even in their, in their defense, they're able to maneuver the players, not just left and right, but up and down the court as well. So they're able to block close to the net, or they're even able to open up and get the opponent out of position. So they're creating a lot of opportunities for themselves to make the uh, defensive into an offensive. As an opponent, if I were to play against them, it's not easy to read uh, how am I supposed to move around the court. So given when you have two players on court, that would make it even worse yeah, because their shots are varying all the time. I like what you said about you know being so versatile and also owning the court as well, right? You know, yeah. really taking control of the game. But of course, in the game, they were also upset as well. And one of the biggest ones was Indonesia not meddling in any of the discipline. This is the first time this has ever happened, but they could turn things around in the Arctic Open. Do you think the experienced daddies could perhaps ignite some spark back in the team? So I think in general, right, Indonesian players are top level athletes and uh, they definitely would you know, bounce back from, from this uh, Asian Games uh, no medal uh, kind of scenario. Uh, uh, the daddies will be playing in, in the Arctic Open and you know, given that they did not compete in the Asian Games, they have a bit of rest and they're able to focus and concentrate on, on this competition. Uh, the daddies are definitely very experienced uh, doubles players, so I believe they would be able to, you know, focus and, and set their, if they set their mind to it, they're definitely able to win a couple of rounds. I would not uh, promise that they will be champions, but definitely they would go far. Yeah. So I, I know that the daddies are up against uh, the German pair in the first round uh, and hope that they can uh, stay focused and uh, use their experience to get it in the back win that first round and have that momentum to proceed to the next few rounds. 
With the Asian Games just concluded, there are bound to be players who won't be as fresh as the daddies, and this could be an advantage to some. For example, if we look at the men's singles draw and pick out the opening match between second seed Kunlavut Vititsan and Christo Papa. So I think uh, Kunlavut, right, is world champion. I mean, our newly crowned world champion. A lot of media, definitely, when he went back, mm -hmm. a lot of distractions. Uh, when you have won such a big title and, and it's not easy it's not easy for athletes when they have won such a big competition and after that they need to still continue to play the next few games he himself mentioned in the news I've read that you know he needs to train more and train more meaning yes definitely you can see that uh, he hasn't had time to really you know, set aside to, to focus on training yeah so so uh, this match uh, Kunlavut up against Christo Popov, right? Uh, I think it would be an interesting match. Popov is also a relatively good player. And, and uh, let's see how he can push uh, Kunlavut to, the, to, the, to his limit and maybe hopefully even be able to win. Before I let you go, let's look at the women's singles category. Tai Tuing is the only top four player to be competing in Finland. Does that make her your favourite going in? And if not, who do you think could be her strongest challenger here? I think uh, Tai Tuing, you know, she has had a, a very tiring week, you know, the Asian Games, team events, individuals. For sure. And uh, going forward towards the European leg. The European leg is a long one, so hopefully she's uh, well rested. And, and given that she has a bye in the first round of the Arctic Open, she has that one additional day of rest. And uh, we'll see. Uh, there are a few good players in, in the Arctic Open that can match up against her. I think we can look out for players like Zhang Bei Wen uh, from the US. Uh, you also have uh, a few women singles players from Denmark. We all know Tai Tzu Ying is a fighter on court. So I believe uh, at, for every match that she plays, right, she's going to put in 100%. Yeah. And even though she's tired or what, but she's definitely going to do her very best for each of the matches that she plays. Like. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to that and it looks to be a very exciting Arctic Open. Once again, thank you so much, Derek, for taking the time to join us and for sharing your insight as always. Thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, great to be here and I'll see you next time. Now, he may not be in our studio, but Steen Pedersen also shared with us some great insights on why he thinks the Korean women's team is having such a great run this year as seen in the Asian Games. So let's hear from the man himself in the newest edition of Steen's Expert Pick. Hi, I'm Steven Pedersen, BWF commentator. Today we take a look at the recent success of the uh, Korean uh, women's team, with especially uh, focusing on the uh, women's doubles. Well, here in 2023, it's obvious that An Se Young has played magnificently in the women's singles, but actually the Korean women's doubles have also performed really well throughout the year, in my opinion. Not only in the individual tournaments where Baek and Lee have uh, three tournament wins in uh, this season and Kim and Kong has four, have they performed well, but they've also uh, played a pivotal role in uh, the uh, team tournaments last week where they uh, helped the Korean team to win the Asian Games for the first time in, in 30 years. Uh, Baek and Lee defeated uh, Chen Ching Chen and Jia Yifan the current world ranking number one and the two Korean pairs are the closest competitors that currently ranked second and uh, third in the world. The Korean women's doubles pairs all play from a very, very solid defense and for Baek and Lee, they're really, really strong movers and uh, that means that they are uh, capable of, of working really hard and um, supplementing each other in the uh, attacking game. They're not the hardest hitters in the women's doubles department, but they're very consistent and they can keep on going for a very long time. As for uh, uh, Kong Hee Young and, and Kim So Young, well, uh, Kim has uh, always been a, a strong attacker, both from the backcourt with a good steep smash, uh, she's a tall player, and also finishing uh, the rallies from the front court. I think We've seen uh, over this year here, both of these pairs develop in terms of their front court play and especially Bei Kana and uh, Kong Hee Young has developed, in my opinion, in two combinations. Now if we look at uh, Lee So Hee and, and Bei Kana, I think many were surprised when uh, the Korean coach Lee Kyung Wong decided to uh, 
put these two players together. That turned out to be a brilliant move. Uh, Lee So-hee, who uh, has played with uh, numerous uh, other players, and so has Bae Kana. That, that's one of the uh, trademarks of the Korean women's doubles, that they play in different pairings, and I think that helps them develop playing style. They have different roles and different partnerships. And here in this partnership with Bae Kana, Lee actually has quite a different role from her previous partnership with uh, Shin Sung Chan. In that partnership, Lee was the uh, main backcourt player. But in the beginning of the partnership with Bae Kana, she actually took the role of the uh, frontcourt player, the one who made the moves in the defense, who turned the defense around, where Bae Kana uh, was more taking the role of um, of the backcourt player. Now, given that uh, Kim and Kong and Baek and, and Lee at the moment are the uh, strongest competitors to the uh, number one on the world rank, the Olympic silver medalist, uh, Chen Ching Chen and, and Jia Yifan, it's interesting to, to take a look at um, how they match up against uh, these uh, two magnificent Chinese players. And uh, one of the things that I found out when, when researching this is that it's actually quite interesting that Baek and Lee in their matchups against Chen and Jia, it's, it's quite significant that if the playing conditions are slow, then Baek and Lee have the advantage. So the interesting thing is, of course, why does it help Baek and Lee so much to play in slow playing conditions? In my opinion, it's because they have this solid defense that makes them capable of playing much, much longer rallies. They can extend the rallies against Chen and Jia. And when they play these long rallies, then the uh, ability to move well, the speed of movement on court uh, comes into play. And here, I think the Koreans have an advantage over uh, Chen and, and Jia. Uh, they are very agile, both Lee So-hee and, um, and Bae Kana. And eventually they can uh, turn the tables on uh, the world number ones. And if they get in trouble, they can just uh, play to the backcourt and let the Chinese uh, try and attack. Uh, one more time. That's not possible in a little bit faster playing conditions where Jia Yifan, especially her uh, attacking abilities, will come into play and the uh, Koreans will not be able to survive long enough to get the advantage in the rallies. In terms of the future, of course, uh, Bae Kana and, and Lee So Hee, they're not um, through with, with their development. We've already seen Bae Kana in the, uh, some of the recent tournament where she's been much more adventurous uh, at the front court. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful development because in women's doubles, uh, we've so often on commentary discussed the fact that you need to function well in both roles in the women's doubles, both the front court player and the back court player. You have to play preferably equally well. That's not always the case, but you have to play both of them well. You cannot be uh, sort of like a one-trick pony and only play well at the front court or only play well at the back court. It will be too easy for the opponents to outmaneuver you. So the overall conclusion to this is that we have uh, a fierce rivalry going on in the uh, women's doubles between mainly uh, Chen and Jia as the world number one and the two uh, best Korean pairs at the moment, Bae Kan Ah, Lee So Hee and uh, Kim and, and Kong. I think there's a possibility that the Koreans might um, develop their game and also now they don't have to play as many tournaments as they did when they were uh, a totally new pairing, Baek and Lee, in order to move up in the world ranking. So they can select it a little bit more and, and be a little bit more fresh for those tournaments. And if they continue their development as a pair, uh, I think there's a chance in the future they could overtake the world number one spot from Chen and Jia. Thanks so much, Dean, for that. And once again, thank you to Derek for joining us earlier in the show. That is all the time we have for today, but don't forget to mark your calendars for the A Super 500 event of the year, the Clash of Clans Arctic Open 2023, powered by Yonex. Starting from the 10th of October all the way through to the 15th. Let us know who you're keeping an eye on in Finland, so don't forget to share your thoughts and comments on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Until next week, everybody, take care.